Welcome to the next episode of the Business of Sports show. Now, we've finally managed to nail this guy down. He's been set in the world of life, going from country to country, talking about rugby. And we finally managed to all surprise him away from the gym, which if you check his Instagram out, it looks like he lives <laughs> in the place. Uh, so today's guest is none other than Phil Davis. Hey, Phil. Hi, Matt. Compliments of the season to you. How are you doing? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. Yourself? Yeah, not bad, not bad. I appreciate your patience. Thank you very much for, for your persistence and patience when I've been uh, jetting about the place. <laughs> no, well, yeah, you've no, been getting been, around, haven't you? Yeah, it's been a fair a fair bit going on since I started my 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 new job with World Rugby. It's, uh, i I got to be honest, it's a great privilege and, uh, you know, feel really blessed of the opportunity to go around the world talking about a game we both love. So... Just going around talking about rugby, seeing you know how other you know people in different parts of the world try and grow the game, their uh, you know their opinions on the game, their their thought processes around those opinions. So yeah, it's been it's been really interesting. But overall, I met some amazing people, and uh, and and there's more to come, which is the exciting bit for me, really. Definitely. So for for the people watching who may not know who uh, who Phil Tulip Davis is. Uh, we'll go into how you got the nickname as well. Uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, um, I'm I'm a Welshman. Obviously, born in born in Sam Sisters near Neath. Um, in, back in for a long time ago now, but uh, yeah, brought up in the village. I d- did um, I used to swim a lot and play football until I got too big and I couldn't get a jersey for me with football. So then I started playing rugby and I'd enjoyed it and. Ended up in Clenetley, uh, playing rugby in Clenetley um, and working at the time. Uh, I used to work for Day's uh, Motor Company in Swansea. I had a great, great uh, time there. Worked for a couple of really good employers, actually, when I, when I was playing, who looked after me. I worked uh, sales and marketing mainly, enjoyed that. Went and, you know, continued to play rugby when I played with Clenetley for 15 years. Went in the police for a couple of years. Was a policeman in Patalbot um, for a few years. Uh, met some great people there, but predominantly my rugby career was Snatchley. Then played for Wales, and then sort of you know went into coaching. So I've always coached as a professional, but I always played as an amateur. Um, and as somebody once told me, it's all about people. Uh, and I've been so lucky over, over the years that whether, whether I worked or played rugby or coached rugby. The people I've met around the world and the countries I've visited have been fantastic. So that's a little bit about you know where I started, a small village in 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 South Wales, and uh, ended up going all over the world really through rugby. And uh, I feel very lucky for that uh, for that opportunity or for those opportunities which are continuing, thankfully. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, you, like I said, you, you're clocking up the the miles these days because now you're director of rugby for World Rugby, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, director of rugby for World Rugby. It's it's uh, it's a role that Joe Schmidt had, the former Irish coach, and Joe uh, left to go back home to New Zealand, and they reconfigured the role slightly differently to what Joe had. So my role sits as director of rugby sits in a player welfare and rugby services department. So player welfare, you know, <coughs> it says what it says on the tin, the amount of research to try to make the game as safe as possible for the players, match officials, everyone involved on the field obviously and rugby services is about developing countries uh capability and capacity to grow the game uh so there's you know there's lots of different elements to the department but it's a wonderful um business to work in uh feel proud to represent you know world rugby um and have an opportunity to try and make a difference in the game that that i love really to be honest and that's that's the special part about it for me is being able to speak about rugby every day, uh, yeah. and, go, and go around the world and and try and help, you know, and support some brilliant people to grow the game. I mean, what I was going to do in my my due diligence on you, your, your background check, I see that you're working with uh, Mark Harrington. Yes, he's got my, a bone uh, to pick with him. He's my boss. Why? Why is that? 
<laughs> he never he never picked me for, to play for Somerset when I had trials years and years and years ago. Uh, so I'm, you'll have to have a conversation with that. You won't have I, a clue who I am, but it's fine. <laughs> I will remind him he's, he's to be fair, I, I've known Mark for a while, but um he's uh I met some pretty good administrators in the game, but you know, he's to be fair, he's um he's he's outstanding. He's a great, great person, a uh, good guy to work for. Uh, uh, and work with, you know, when we've got a great department as well as, you know, there are numerous other departments in World Rugby as well that, that, that do a fantastic job. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. It's not because I'm just working there now. Somebody said that to me the other day. You're going you're gonna to say all the good things, but trust me, after 35 plus years in rugby, I've, I've, come, I've come across some, you know, various ways of working and some of these guys are, 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 are outstanding really and you know the game is is you know is 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 being driven in the right way with the right intentions uh, to grow the game, and that's that's the beauty of world rugby. There's no bias anywhere other than let's grow the game, which is which is fabulous, really. Sorry, okay. we'll come on to the kind of global scene um, in a bit, but let's go back to your your playing days. So you found yourself putting the red shirts on of. of the mighty Clashley playing at Stradi. I mean, what was that like? I mean, I, I used to go to Stradi all the time, season ticket holder, you know, great, great memories down there. But what was it like actually playing on that hallowed turf? Yeah, you know, I'm getting goosebumps when you mention the word Stradi Park. Um, I, it was, it was, it was amazing, mate, but it was made them, it was. It was amazing because of the people, the people in the terraces, you know, uh, the the main stand or the Tanner Bank as it was then, uh, uh, the Pooth end, the scoreboard end, whichever end, you know, there were always different characters there. So it was the people first and foremost, it was the supporters, it was the town, and then it was the people, the coaches, you know, and the players and, and the players of the past, like Phil Bennett, God bless him, Derek Quinnell and Ray Gravel, I actually played with Grab my first couple of games. I, I played with Les. He was with was with Ray, and and then you know Gareth Jenkins was such a big part of my playing career. The only coach I really had at club level, uh, other than when I went into the police force, uh, obviously there. And we had um, uh, we had Mister Dyer, as I used to call him, there from Glenith. He was our coach at the police, and you had people like Phil Noble, Steve Sutton, people like that. You know Richie Donovan, who was the first ever. Welsh Cup from the from the South Wales Police at that time. So, it all, all of those. That's what made Stradi so special. Matt was was the people, and obviously the the museum with all the history there. And there were lots of people on the committee, like Norman Gale was chairman, who was you know a great player in his own right, and coached Sanetli with Karen James, and they beat New Zealand in 1972. So. It was all that sort of history and 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 heritage and where you come from is important. And Gareth drummed that into us about representing the town of Lethley, which was you know which was huge for for him and huge for all of us as well. And the connection we had with the supporters as well was 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 unique. If and you know, I always used to remember going upstairs in Stradi. If I played well, there was a it was two guys called Graham and Bert. And they were uh, they had an industrial cleaning business. They were characters, and they were very they sponsored Leslie for years. And I'd always know if I would played well because I had a pint on the table waiting for me as I come upstairs into the into the papers <laughs> bar. And if and if and if, and if I didn't have a pint there, they they would they'd ignore me basically. <laughs> <laughs> so so I knew if I played well, I'd a, I'd a beer. If I didn't play well, I'd buy my own. So anyway, but that wasn't a problem. But. Uh, so no, it was it was the people really and the history of of the Scarlets and and Tlesley and and we tried to build we tried to put our piece on 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 top of what Benny and the boys did in the sixties and the seventies you know in the early eighties you know through to the mid nineties when I finished uh, that's what we tried to do is build is build you know build on their legacy and and leave leave our own so to speak you know yeah and I think Shadi always had that kind of kind of magical element to it as well with the supporters going on at half time and and you know these days you know you you, you step foot on a pitch and uh, you know you, you're going to be done by the police um whereas in those days you used to run on at half time get a few signatures kick a ball around you know do all of that it was almost had a village kind of feel to it um but i mean 
did you ever kind of feel the pressure of the history of the weight of you know Benny and the boys um their legacy and, and the fact that you've got to carry that torch on because you uh, played was it something like 380 plus games yeah 398 so Les Williams Mr. Stats, statistician tells me yeah so and I was captain for six years as well which is a huge privilege really um and I remember you talk about kids running on the field at half time. I remember the first couple of times I was captain and we'd all sit, I'd st- I'd sort of sit in the middle of the, or go down on my on one knee, if you like, sit in the middle of the of the of the boys, and then they'd they'd obviously be there and they'd they'd sort of link arms, but then you'd see these little faces poking, you know, poking through the middle of the legs or whatever, <laughs> these young kids listening in, you know. And, it was the first time I was ranting and raving and effing and blinding at the time, and I'm looking up thinking, "Oh no, <laughs> there's two or three youngsters there." So, so my 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 halftime team talks in the middle of Stradi changed after the first couple of when I realised there were young children were coming on the field and listening to me. So, but yeah, it was just it were magical times, and you know the games we played. I remember when we beat Australia. You know, the, everybody ran on the field, and I remember the groundsman saying. There'd be trouble if it was a pitch invasion after Jeff Lee, the groundsman, shouted at, at Gareth before the game. And after the <coughs> game, Jeff, Jeff was on the side of the field with his hands in his cap. He used to always wear a flat cap. And he was like this, because there was thousands on the field after we'd beaten Australia and people were going absolutely nuts. Uh, and it was all, all those things were, were amazing. And some of the big games we played against Swansea, some of the derbies and Neath and... And the cup matches and the touring games we played, it was a special place to go. Um, you know, I was always, you know, when we used to drive down down the street towards Stradley in a bus before the big games, you know, and the band would be playing and the people walking in. And it's just, yes, yeah, it was it was different then. It was the as I say, the connection between the supporters and 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 the players were was massive, and and I didn't we we didn't we didn't we were just excited, Matt. We were young kids. I was eighteen when I played with Leslie first, and then you know I was I think I was twenty twenty one when I went to the cup final when I first played for Wales, and it's just we were excited. We weren't weighed down by anything. We were just excited by the opportunities that we had, and you'd see all the great players around watching us play and everything, and it was inspiring more than anything, to be honest. It was, it was, it was, you know, you didn't want to let anybody down, and as Gara said, you didn't want to leave. <clears throat> it was all about the town with him. It was all about Clenetley, born and bred, played with Clenetley schoolboys, Gara did, and it was all about that, and it was it was all about representing the town, really, and all that went with it. And the former Scarlets, were obviously Leslie players, were, were were part of that, you know. Yeah. So obviously, you went on to play for Wales. I mean, kind of talk us through that kind of that mm-hmm. moment when you got the call or the letter or, or you know, yeah. however you were told in those days. Kind of, what did that kind of feel for you? Well, it's the obvious in a way, and then it? it was it was elation. I remember I put the phone down uh, firstly on John Bevan, who was the coach then. God bless him, the ex Aberavon fly half. It was a great coach. Him and Terry Cobner were my first two Welsh coaches. You know, I was forever grateful for the to the two of them for selecting me. But Richard Moriarty, I got into the Welsh squad when I was eighteen, and it was Eddie Butler, God bless him, John Thomas, and Richard Moriarty. Um, although Dickie was playing second row a little bit then, but they were the three number eights and they were all not available for one reason or the other. And I thought when John Bevan phoned the house, they phoned my mother and father's house, and um, I thought it was one of the boys winding me up because there had been a little bit of talk. I'd been out in Hong Kong with Robert Jones playing for the crosses of the Hong Kong Sevens in 1985. Uh, and I'd just come out to the police force and... Um, the Welsh game against England had been cancelled. I think it was for foot and mouth, maybe at that time, in the in the eighties, and it was put back to April, and that's what gave me the opportunity. Uh, yeah. So I thought I thought John was one of the boys taking a mickey out of me, basically. So I, my sister said, "Oh, it's, uh, some John Bevan's on the phone, some coach," because <laughs> my sister didn't have a clue. So I looked and I said, "Who's this?" Come on, who's this? You know, I said, oh, bugger off. I put the phone down. <laughs> so he, pho- he phoned back and he said to my sister, tell Phil not to put the phone down. 
tell him to, anyway. So I said, right, come on in. Who is it? He said, Phil, it's John Bevan. I said, are you, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, we've, we've selected, we picked you to play for Wales against England. Uh, sorry, we picked you to play for Wales. So when he, I realised it was him, but I didn't wait for him to tell me who we were playing and when we were playing. I just threw the phone up in the air and smashed against, smashed against the ceiling. So, oh. so I had to go next door then to my, our next door neighbours, Terence and Diane, and I said, oh, can I use the phone? I need to phone someone. <laughs> Uh, I said, I've just been picked to play for Wales, I think, but I don't know against two and I don't know when. So, so I'd rung him back and I rung John back and then obviously he told me I was playing against England, blah, blah, blah. And then off I went, mate, you know, uh, which was we played England first game and then uh, we played Fiji. I think it was the second game. I had a couple of tries at Cardiff. So my first two games were at Cardiff, which was amazing, really. And then uh, I played with Jonathan as well, who became my brother-in-law, a year yeah. later, and, and and Kevin Hawkins, we were the three new caps. Well, I was the only, I was the first new cap. There was only myself, and then something happened, and they picked Kevin, and then something happened. I think Gareth Davis retired, and Malcolm Davis, he was injured, and Jonathan got the call then. So, yeah, that's how it all started. It was, it was quite, uh, it was amazing. And down the village as well, there was only, an, only Glenshaw had ever, you know, played for Wales, the senior team. So I was the first. And he wasn't born and bred in a village, but he played for the village. So myself and then latterly Phil Pill, we were the only two senior internationals that actually were born and bred in a village. So it was quite a proud moment for everybody attached to the village as well. And particularly my coach, Morris Davis, who got me into rugby, basically. He was the reason I played the game, you know. So yeah, in the first place when I was a kid and my school teacher... Malcolm Griffiths as well. Two Malcolms, actually. Malcolm Griffiths, Malcolm Jones. One was from Glenith. One was from... Uh, um, where was... Uh, Brunaman, my school teacher in, in Neath was. And then Morris was from the village as well. So, yeah. So I had some good mentors and influences in my early days. And then Gareth was my main influence when I played with Lesley. I played for Wales, really, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, because, yeah, you are you are a one-club player, aren't you? Yeah, I did. Other than I went, as I said, I was lucky to have the opportunity. David East, God bless him, was the chief constable of South Wales at the time. A brilliant man all round. What a man. Um, and he offered me an opportunity. I went into the police force, but I wanted to play with Leslie. It was crazy, really. It, I, I just left the police force to go back and deliver spuds with my old man in Neath. And uh, it was it was a crazy, when I think back, it was, an, it was a bonkers decision in some ways, but... That, that was yeah. my my passion and my love for the game. You know, I, I gave up a police career and lots of boys like Mark Perigo, Hugh Williams Jones, Steve Sutton, they're all retiring at 48, 50, and I'm still carrying on working. But, uh, but well, not so much working, but I love doing what I'm doing. But uh, lots of boys I joined with <coughs> retired after 30 years' service. So, yeah, it was, it was a crazy decision work wise at the time, but. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but that's all I was thinking about. I wanted to play with Lashley more and I wanted to play for Wales. And that's how it that's how I made the decision. <laughs> Much to my so, father's disappointment. Well, yeah, I, I can imagine. But then again, you know, what a journey has put you on. Oh, yeah. So, sure. Obviously, you know, you mentioned it earlier in terms of your know, playing days were amateur. You know, so yeah. so therefore that, that makes that decision to, you know, leave a career like in the police force to go and play amateur sports, um, even more kind of bonkers. Were there any opportunities for you to kind of move around to other clubs or, or, or were you well and truly ingrained with Clashley? Um, yeah, there was, there was, there was, there was something in Cardiff once with Peter Thomas, who's a wonderful man, as we all know, his, his contribution to Welsh rugby and Welsh life is, is incredible really. And, and I spoke, you know, Roger Bly, the Mike James at the at the Whites at one point, but ultimately it was not. I was never. I, it wasn't in my heart to leave Clancy. Really, even in rugby league, I got opportunities to go to Warrington. I got opportunities to go to St Helens um, back in the day, and 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 I love rugby league, and I did go north to coach, not to play, but I was just. I I think 
I was lucky to play. I love Llanelli. Gareth's enthusiasm was ridiculous. He could get me to play now, I think, for 30 seconds, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only could, time you spend could, in the gym, you're probably fine. No, I don't do it. I could run I could run out well and I'll be about the end of it. But uh, no, it was, I think I was lucky. I had that passion for the club. And, you know, and if I did speak to some people over time, it, it wasn't the right thing to do, really. It's more curiosity. And... Funny, my respect for those people as well. I had huge respect for the for the whites at that time, and Mike Ruddick and what Mike did there, and and Stewart and Rob. A lot of my best friends, you know, um, played you know there. We had a huge rivalry with Swansea and back in the day, and and Cardiff as well with Peter. And such respect for Terry Holmes and Gareth Davis, Bob Norster, those guys. But my heart was always in Clenessy, really, and and um, it was a waste of time speaking to them in some ways. But it was my respect for them. I think that. I led me to speak to them and uh, I thought I would move at one point, but not really, you know, uh, it was not going to happen. West is best, as I say. Yeah. Well, I was grav all over. I love him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I was lucky that I worked for, you know, I worked for three people. Graham Day was one guy at, uh, at Day's in Gosain and they're still going now. They're still one of the biggest Ford retailers in the South Wales, Southwest. And then it was a guy, MRJ Phillips, who was, a big supporter of Clashley. I worked for him. Um, and it was another guy, Gerard Davis, who was who was a financial guy who I worked for him as well. And they were the three of them over my career, 15, 16 years, were really supportive. And I did, you know, I always tried to do my job for them. I always wanted to do a good job for them, learn about what I was involved with. And being a rugby player was advantageous. People in Forty knew you my ugly face. So it was it was a good opportunity to you know, to try and build a career in those different fields, you know, the motor industry um, or the financial services or Richie was waste disposal and scrap metal. That was an interesting experience, that was. But they were all good people and very yeah. supportive of very supportive of myself, very supportive of Clenesley in particular, very supportive of Wales as well. And they still do to this day. They still support the Scarlets and they still support Wales. So, you know, they've... they've um, you know, they've been, you know, brilliant supporters of Welsh rugby in, in not just going to games, but in terms of sponsoring and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I was lucky. I was, again, it comes all down to people, mate. That was, you know, knowing, you know, being involved with good people and, and, and trying to do your best for those people, you know. Definitely. So when you look back at your playing career, is there anything you think, I wish I'd done that? You know, um, kind of taking an opportunity or, or, or was even given an opportunity to do something? Um, the Lions was a disappointment. I think one year in 1989, they'd played, they played, um, uh, I'd played, you know, well. Wales didn't have a good season, but personally, I, what, I, I played some good rugby. I heard Player of the Year awards, all that sort of stuff, which is fine in one ways, but you you can't get those unless you're part of a good team as well. So yeah. But I, I didn't get picked to go to Australia when a lot of people thought I would. And then in in the November time, I think it was, I remember Bob Wayhill, he's passed away now, was, I think he, I can't remember if he was chairman of the Lions or back in those days, but they picked me to play for the Lions in France. Um, in a, It was like a cent, bicentennial game. I think France were playing the Lions. It was a bit of a one-off game. And Rob Andrew and I were picked, and he was picked as captain, Rob Andrew, and I was picked as vice captain for the Lions. And uh, it was a one-off game in Paris, and I I, I didn't play. Um, okay. I, was, I, was, I was injured, I was. My back was, I hurt, I was injured. But when I look back, you know, I always think, did I do as much as I could, you know, to be fit for that match, for that game, you know? And it yeah. was, because I'm, you know, I'm a very passionate Welshman, but... Like passion and emotion. When when Phil is passionate, I can be really good. I can be world class as a. But then when I'm emotional, sometimes you get that irrational type of thinking, and uh, and sometimes that's been an Ach that was an Achilles heel for me during my playing at times. Um, not all, not often enough, but sometimes more often when I look back. But I don't regret anything really, Matt, because you know I always try to do, you know my best, I know a lot of people will say that, but I put my heart and soul into the Scarlets and as did a lot of other people and um, it meant a lot to me, it meant a lot to all of us at that time and still does, to be honest. And um, yeah. yeah, 
it's um you know that's always been for me my passion has been my biggest strength and and sometimes it's my biggest weakness at times you know so but it's learn you learn and and you try and do your best and and, and you move on you know and you don't always life doesn't go in a straight line is it that's the beauty of it all uh, yeah and at the end of the day you know every decision that you've made has, has led up to to now um yeah. You know, yeah. being on this podcast, you know, you're peaking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> peaking, I just... <laughs> uh, uh, it's um, only do technique, it's only do style, it's good. <laughs> it's relaxed. Well, well, thank you. Let's get into the hard stuff then. So you, obviously, you finished playing and then you went into coaching. Was that a big transition for you or um, was it just something that you, because you, uh, you said earlier that you'd always kind of done a bit of coaching and, and, and things like that. So was it just a natural progression for you? Um, I don't. I'd, I'd, I'd enjoyed. Be, I enjoyed being the leader. I did. I, I would captain Tlesley. You know, I was. I was. Um, uh, uh, you know, I was leading. You know, for the Welsh team as well. I was vice captain of the ninety one World Cup. Yaya was captain. I was vice captain. So I was in school the same. So I'd always been either the captain, you know, a vice captain more often than not. Not every single year it was with Tlesley. Don't get me wrong, but. You know, if I wasn't captain, you know, I was vice captain with Mooney for a couple of years, as I say. So I, I'd always enjoyed that side of the game. I'd always tried to, you know, when I was at Clenetley, it was all, you know, Gareth and I used to turn Alan Lewis and then Kel Coslett and then when Buck retired, Buck was manager. So I always enjoyed that interaction with my coaches and, and, and tried to have a leadership role, not just on the field, which is the most important thing, but but also off the field and how how we could look after the players and, and all that sort of stuff, you know. So I'd always led that I wanted to coach and give something back. And I could have continued to play at Tlenetli as a professional. That was one option. Another option, Robert Jones and I had to go to Harlequins for two years. Dick Best had offered us an opportunity to go to London to play, which was interesting, yeah. um, you know, to go and live and play in London. That did attract me a little bit. But I thought, well, if I'm going to play rugby, I'm going to play professionally for Clashley. I was that was that was it. But then yeah. I had a phone call from Leeds, Colin Stevens, my old Clashley teammate, was up there, and he said, "Look, they're looking for a director of rugby. They're in the fourth division. Two clubs heading around. They had merged. They'd sold the ground. They had a bit of money um, to to start them off, uh, and they wanted to get in the Premiership." Uh, I went, okay. So I went up there and drove up there on my own, uh, really, one night or one afternoon. Got up there at 10 o'clock in the night. Never been in the place, never been near Leeds before. Understood from football, Billy Bremner, all those. <laughs> John Charles, you know, Glenn Leatheran was a big football, big, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's still around San Esli now, Glenn. He's a, he's, a, he's a scout for Leeds, but he played for Leeds United. So I knew, that's all I knew, uh, but just yeah. drove there. And, you know, sometimes you go somewhere, don't you? And it just feels right. It feels, yeah. I don't know why. I just have no idea. I have no idea at all, but I went up there and they offered me a contract for three years. Uh, then I was there for a year. They offered me another another two years. So that ended up being sort of like a, a four-year contract, if you like. And then it, the club was taken over. And then... I just kept renewing my contract every two years with, with Paul and Gary uh, Hedrington and Paul Caddick, and they're still there now with the Rhinos. Uh, and I stayed there 10 years, and we went from the fourth division to the Premiership and I won a major trophy, played in the Heineken Cup, you know, and produced one of the best academies England had at the time, with Stuart Lancaster. He was my captain when I first went, and then he became the academy manager, and then obviously took over my role when I left, and obviously... Since the rest is history, it's done a few things, yeah. Yeah, he's he's an amazing guy. And Simon Easter, he was the same. I gave him his first professional contract, and you know, Simon Middleton was another one. He came through as a player, then he he, he became my defense coach. And obviously, he's been coaching the Red Roses, the English women's team, for quite a number of years, been successful. So, again, mate, it was people, it was an opportunity. And it just felt right. And we had, a, we had a wonderful time as a family up there. The kids were six and eight when we moved. Uh, you know, they did all their education up there. And Caroline, you know, we moved up. Only the four of us. You know, it was, we just went. We didn't know anyone. Um, yeah. It was more, more difficult for my wife and the girls. And, 
you know, I admire them so much for what they did at that time because I was good out meeting hundreds of people every, you know, I was meeting loads of people every day through rugby. And, yeah. You know, they were in the house in Adeline Leeds and they didn't know anybody, basically. And and they had to find a way and they had to find their way. And we had to find our way as a family. So it was, yeah, it was amazing. And uh, um, hugely grateful for the, the, that opportunity, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, what you did at Leeds... I mean, taking them from the fourth division to the Premiership, you know, is no small feat at the end of the day. You know, again, mm. professional rugby, you know, it is quite difficult to to kind of make that, that leap from from the Championship to the Premiership, and and you know, like you said, then to experience European rugby and and all of that. I mean, yeah, you, when you do look back and you think about the, the kind of people that came out of that environment, it's, it's quite a decent number. Yeah, you mentioned okay, Stuart Lancaster, you know, Simon Easterby, you know, currently defensive coach with, with Ireland, who are absolutely flying high at the moment, uh, mm. going into you know the World Cup cycle. I mean, yeah. How do you feel about having a hand in in kind of formulating that and building that environment? Oh, the, the environment was I was I was I was lucky that we there wasn't really, there wasn't, it was two clubs, you know, Headley, Ian McGeekin, you know, uh, Roundy, Brian Moore, Richard Cardis, right, some brilliant players coming out of Peter Winterbottom or Headley. There was a lot of history there, but when it merged to become Leeds, it was, because Leeds then was in, it was in the same league as Morley, Harrogate, Wharfdale, <laughs> Otley. So you talk about parochialism in Wales, it was to, an, to another level up there, but they were brilliant people. Uh, and and to be fair to them, they afforded me, you know, an audio. Winty was, I think Peter Winterbottom in the background was helpful at times because we played against each other, England, Wales, and 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 his dad, you know, Peter's dad was was an amazing fella as well. He was involved in Headley. So I had a lot of people who were wanting, you know, wanting us to do well. And there were other people who were trying to stop us as well. But that's oh, that's yeah. life. But you know, I had a group of players who were, I think, I think they'd signed Leeds, maybe 20 plus players. Mike Bidgood, who was the secretary there and who's still involved now, was a character. And we I didn't know any players. I didn't, I, I only knew Colin. I didn't know. I remember my first training session, the 52 players on the touchline, and we were talking about tackle technique. And um, anyway, it was just interesting. And, and I was just doing it. As I, through my my passion, through my heart, through my emotion, and and it was it was bonkers really. And the players were unbelievable. In the first two or three years, they were incredible. How they put up with some of my crazy thinking, I don't know, but they did. And <laughs> just, but you know, I'd always I'd always had a huge passion for looking after players and trying to do. I mean, an individual way of looking after them and 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 trying to help them develop and grow. When we lost, you know, we lost some players along the way, obviously, but um, but some of those players went on to become extremely successful businessmen because a lot of you know rugby union in Leeds is a white collar sport. Arguably, it's it's mm. it's it's you know you've got a lot of guys from the city uh, who were accountants, listeners, really intelligent guys and. You know, I had some business owners. My first captain at Leeds, Paul Johnson, you know, he was a textile merchant, uh, textile business in Huddersfield. So, again, brilliant people, Matt, and they just, they bought into into it. And, and you know, we developed the squad. Uh, we bought players in. And we always tried to bring players in who were, you know, were team players. You know, we always used to yeah. say, leave your, leave your ego at the gate. And the years that, you know, over my coaching career, where I've not, where I've recruited well, I've kept that mindset. It's all about the team, uh, and with a family, and with all that. And and then sometimes when I've strayed away from that, it's 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 bit me on the it's bit the team on the bum really. So you've got yeah. to make sure that when you build a team, you've got to have a real clear um, philosophy about what the purpose is, what the team stands for, and. Your team has always got to represent your local community. You know, it, it it's people who are coming to watch the team play. You've got to recognise themselves in that team. Like in Yorkshire, it was it was hard work. It was grit, determination. That's what they wanted to see from their team. 
so yeah. you have, you have to understand, you know, I believe local local mindsets, local communities, and and create you know an environment and a culture in your club that can that can build those qualities so that people when they come and stand on the terrace or they pay their their good money, they're gonna recognize that team in themselves. And that's how you get teams behind. That's why Stradi was so it's important. The passion. the passion. The supporters mm. are my, you know, they, they always used to call them one-eyed scarlets and they are. <laughs> well, yeah. well talk, talking about one-eyed scarlets, you then obviously ventured back. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I I did not again I don't opportunity to go to Saracens with Eddie Jones at the time there was there was an opportunity to coach there um, and I remember speaking to Mark Sindabry who was a CEO at Saracens at the time about a role and I just said look I've signed for the Scarlets and I went back and we had an amazing year you know I was asked mm. to go and do a job to create a professional structure within the club um, which I did and when I look back now the first year was just incredible we had you know, seven out of seven in Europe. We didn't lose a game in the group. Beat Munster, who were the champions at the time, and they went to Leicester to to the semi final. And then the following year, I left. You know, um, and and that was tough to be honest. It was difficult. It knocked me sideways for a while. Uh, I wasn't very good for a couple of years. Really, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't sit down and process it properly. I didn't yeah. look. I didn't look what I could have done better. Uh, I didn't look at th- things. I I didn't look at things I could have controlled, and I didn't look at things that were uncontrollable for me. So that's why I didn't quite get past it. I sort of blame myself for everything and anything that went wrong, uh, and that yeah. is not quite the case. Um, yes, I did things wrong, but I also believed other people maybe could have done things differently themselves perhaps so that was a big learning for me that was and and um it took me a while to get over it to be honest and I didn't I didn't really I was continually chasing an outcome not investing myself in the process whereas when I went to Leeds for 10 years on my first year in Tennessee I I really invested in the process but because of that setback I didn't really uh, I then started looking at the outcome the outcome the outcome and uh that didn't help at all for a while, you know. But but then you learn. Yeah, it. you learn and yeah, and, and, and coaching is a roller coaster, isn't it? And, and, Absolutely. And, and you know, down west, like you said, one-eyed scarlets, it very very passionate, and therefore one minute you could be the hero, and the next minute you're the, the villain. It's, it is a bit of a, that kind of pantomime yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of element to it. And you know, I remember going to um, to a, a a talk you gave. Uh, because I was on the board of the Supporters Trust at the time. And, you know, just given the insight into the analytics behind the scenes and, and the information and, and kind of all this all the work that was going on behind the scenes, yeah, again, from my point of view, I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah. and, and it did seem like that kind of trying to put that professional level, you know, in place, um, which... I kind of feel it was a, probably a little bit ahead of its time in places because you look at everything that people do now, you know, even, even the club I coach, we've got a, uh, one of those um, VO cameras. So therefore, you know, we can break down the games. Now where counties three, Southwest, Somerset, whatever, you know, kind of just a one team team club, but even we've invested in, in that because then it gives us stuff that we can say to players, look, Look at these scrums. Look at these lineouts. Look at, you know, look at the defensive line. Look at the, the stuff that, you know, that was we were doing good. But here are the things that we could do better as well. And and I just think, you know, some of the, uh, I remember t- you were talking about statistics and and you know various other bits and pieces. And I kind of feel like it, yeah, it was maybe a little bit ahead of its time in terms of the facility or even dare I say the area to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. So then you ventured abroad, kind of almost like randomly, um, into international rugby. Yeah, it was. It was like when when I left Llanelli, I went and I had a good job. Um, I went and started working for the WRU, and I had a good job there. 
I really enjoyed it. I was the first National Academy manager there at the time. I went to the Junior World Championships in Japan and Argentina and really enjoyed that. And, and bizarrely, I made a decision to leave to go to Worcester because I'd never been an assistant coach and I respected Richard Hill, uh, the ex-Bath Scrum Half, England Scrum Half, um, who yeah. was at Bristol. And we did a few battles when I was at Leeds with Hilly. Um, and we both respected each other. We did our level fives together at Loughborough University with Kevin Bowden leading the charge there with, again, Stuart Lancaster, John Carla, Joe Lydon, Nigel Redman. We had some great people there. Brian Gorner, who was a real famous England schools coach, brilliant coach um, uh, uh, at the time in England. Um, and and I, I just... I went and they got relegated, unfortunately, because Mike was there, Mike Ruddock, and after they got relegated and Mike left, unfortunately, and then I went with Hilly and we we, we got promoted from the championship. Then I yeah. stayed I stayed for a year in the premiership and then <coughs> Peter Thomas asked me to go to Cardiff to coach, um, which was always a challenge with the budgets at the time. There were three million self-imposed budgets at the time by the regions. Um, and we did, we did, we did all right. Actually, we brought through at the time people like Cody Allen and Cody Hill and and Reese Patcher, Lloyd Williams are starting to come through at that time, and a real strong nucleus of Cardiff boys come that had come through their excellent academy. We get him what's in charge of it, you know. So there was there was my frustration in coaching in Wales, Matt, was there were two opportunities. I always felt that given a bit of patience and a real processed look at what could be achieved over a period of time, uh, given, you know, given not so much the investment, it's just given, you know, time for for programs, for structures to evolve and, and to operate in a way that you can move forward. You know, in the Blues, the second year in the Blues, we beat Toulon at home and we beat Glasgow back to back in Europe. Whereas yeah. the first year we'd only won one game, so and we were playing with a group of players who were unbelievably committed for the team, but a lot of them had been playing semi-pro rugby, but they'd been thrust into professional rugby because of the the limitations of the salary cap and did a brilliant job. To be fair, you know, mm-hmm. so those are the jo- those are the roles that I sort of had before uh, since leaving Clenetley, uh, and then I just made a decision really that that I've all I wanted to go into. Uh, developing nations. I wanted to try to help. I'd been, I'd played at the top level, I'd coached at the top level, uh, I'd been an assistant, I'd been involved in an academy structure with the WRU, and I just wanted to try and help. So Bob Norse at the time wrote to Mark Egan, who was the one of the, the main guys at World Rugby, and I went, did some facilitation and some coaching with Richie Dixon, the ex-Scotland coach out in Stellenbosch in, in South Africa. Yep. With all the emerging, with some emerging nations coaches, I loved it. Talk about my experiences. Richie talked about his. I just it was such a enriching type of experience, giving back to coaches who were thirsty to learn. And then I met the Namibian chief executive, and and then I just, just I just it just went from there. And and when I went to Namibia, I met three of the team that played for Namibia in 1993 against us when I played for Wales in Vinduk in 1993. It was bizarre that they were on the board of the Namibian Rugby Union. And I was coming there as as a sort of a technical advisor with a gentleman called Liam Hennessy, who was, who was, a, who was a genius, really, a strength and conditioning coach who was responsible for putting the Irish Academy system in in the early 2000s. Him and a guy called Des Ryan, who, who, who was at Arsenal, actually, for a while, Des. Uh, they now run a college called Satanta College in uh, in Ireland, and they they develop strength and conditioning coaches. Just you know, they're one of the best in the world, really. So I ended up there having a conference, working with the coaches, and then the coach resigned for some bizarre reason. Uh, and then you know we were looking at who could be the other coach, and the president said, "Well, will you do it, Phil?" I went, "It's not really what I came here to do, but." Anyway, so we discussed, and yeah, I took took the team to the World Cup in England after seven weeks preparation, and we did quite well. We had the best World Cup they'd had at the time. They'd been, you know, and then I stayed for four years to develop a new team. Basically, we created, you know, we got into the Curry Cup a little bit. The results were tough, but nevertheless, the experience was 
there for teams for the boys to build and yeah. and um, it was amazing. We went from an average age of thirty one down to twenty five, um, and and we did well in Japan. We had the best World Cup we had in Japan, and you know played against New Zealand. You know, we were only 10, 9 down, 10, 8 down against the All Blacks after 38 minutes, I think it was. Yeah, I remember watching that and thinking, you know, cracking job. Yeah, it was a bit of a because... killer in the second half, but we gained wow. a lot of credibility, mate. And that was, it was about taking a team. We knew we wouldn't be able to win games, but we, we had, maybe there was one game that we could have won. Uh, Georgia, we lost 16-15 in the, in, in the first World Cup. And in the second World Cup, we thought we'd have a chance of playing against Canada and beating Canada. But uh, but it's an interesting challenge because you 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 just got to try to keep players motivated. You got to try and be really. You got to prioritize the way you coach. Um, you got to really think about how you play given the talent at your disposal. Uh, you got to really know the culture and understand how they think. And and you know you get your head around the Africana mentality is. Is it's different to ours, you know. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. But again, it's all about people. It they were they were just amazing lads, you know. And I just feel so grateful. I actually met them, and I had time to spend in Africa and to learn the culture and to meet people that I still speak to now. Really, it's oh, it was just like all the people I met in my rugby have been. I've been so lucky, you know. Mm. Amazing, unbelievable. I, 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 I suppose it kind of sounds like almost you know, small village rugby playing against the bigger cities to, to kind of really kind of put it there where you're playing with the local lads or, or whoever's available and that, that that talent pool could be literally, you know, a guy that's just picked up a ball you know, last week right the way through to somebody who's played rugby for, for 20 years. Um, but then you're playing up against people who who have the facilities, who have the player bases, who have the time with the players as well to go off on fancy training camps, to do altitude training and God knows what, and have, you know, coaches for every little thing that, that players need. And, and you're there probably on a shoestring budget trying to put a team together to, to go out onto the world stage. And, you know, do you ever think that, given the chance, you know, that if Wales came knocking or, or, or another kind of, you know, kind of tier one nation that, that you'd go, I fancy a crack at that because if I could do this with Namibia, take them into two World, World Cups where they have their best World Cup, that actually they're probably, you know, the next World Cup, they might even, you know, all, almost follow in the footsteps of Japan where Japan, you know, weren't doing that great. And now actually Japan are doing, doing some serious stuff on the world stage. Do you think actually given the opportunity that that you'd like a crack at that? No, not 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 anymore, Matt. There, there was a time where, you know, I remember, you know, I got interviewed to be the Welsh coach before Gareth got the job um uh in 2007 and they 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 came they, oh, sorry man. Oh, sorry. No. One sec. Oh man, one sec. Sorry, Matt. No worries. Sorry, that's my brother-in-law, mate. I always go to answer him, make sure he's all right. <laughs> what? Um, Jiffy? Yeah, yeah, no, he's a top man. You know what? I, I've asked him to come on this before and I haven't had a response, so you know, he should have uh, dropped the word for me. Yeah, I will. I'll tell him after we've... we've finished. What were you saying <laughs> then, sorry? Uh, about having a crack at a tier one. Yeah, no, it was... I remember in... in just the year... The last year I was in Leeds, really, I remember... A friend of mine ringing me up who was working at the Welsh Rugby Union. Anyway, I had a few, I had an interview with them and and a couple of interviews actually with them. And anyway, it didn't work out, which is fine. But um, that's life, part of the journey. But not not now, mate. I think I've my my coaching. And I love coaching. I love going and watching coaching. You know, I went up. You know, I was went up to see Di Flanagan the other day at the Dragons, who I think is an outstanding young coach. He's very process driven. He's got a great view on the game, you know. He's a and he's a great people person, and and I watched everything that he was, you know, watched the day, and it's it's great the way that and I love it, you know. There is there is a passion there to be able to be into a situation where you can build and drive something to to you know to to an end result, and I loved I loved that, and you know 
those days are gone, mate. Really, for me now, it's it's it's. I love this job. What I'm doing at the moment is um is um it's unbelievable, really. And I get to speak to some of the you know the best rugby minds on the planet, really. And some of the, you know whether it's playing or coaching, and I love all of that. And you know, I I want to do this job for another you know until I retire, really. Uh, and those days, you know, are gone. But you know, I've always met. For me, it's always been about getting you know getting a purpose. You know, purpose, vision, values. You know, the people and in the process. You know, it's it's purpose, process, people. If you like, in in an abbreviated form, and that's yeah. those are the big things that I've enjoyed and getting to know. You know, the different people that I've worked with. That I've always been a process driven coach. Always, you know, and 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 when I've had time to build, that's been affected on the scoreboard. But when you work in the way that I work with, you know with with the sports science the medicine the analytics all of that stuff the coaching it takes time to grow and and to develop and um uh and and yeah and i've enjoyed those times even the scarlets i love representing Slashley again i love doing that i i would i'm very proud of coach cardiff as well and did my bit for them you know uh yeah. but it it's it's always a process-driven approach to me. It's, it can't be any different if you want long-term success. Um, very, very true. I mean, you're talking about process and, and time. Um, you know, you mentioned about the regions earlier in terms of, you know, back when you were coaching um, or the Scarlets or, or Cardiff and their imposed, self-imposed um, salary caps of three million. Then, I suppose it's always the case of there are two ways to success. You either grow it or you try and buy it and if you haven't got the budget to buy it then you need the patience to be able to to grow it um do you think there's enough patience in professional sports these days for coaches well if you look at football no not really it's a soccer well, they yeah. change it you know some some guys seven, who... seven matches and you're fired yeah it's, 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 it's absolutely ludicrous it's bonkers and when you look at all the science and you know, you look at the psychology, you look at, you know, psychology, you look at physiology, you look at it all. And 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 it is, you know, within human traits, it takes time. It takes three years to build a team, as Gareth used to say, and then five years to win. So, you know, you should build, if you build a team successfully after three years, years four and five, you should be competing to win trophies. And that's what we did at Leeds in the Premiership. It took us five years to get in the Premiership. Then when we are in the Premiership, it took us five years to win a major trophy. And we'd had a couple of semi-finals. Um, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd been in, we were top of the league at one year. We were top of the Premiership one year in, a, in December. Um, and it just takes time to build that infrastructure. And, it, you know, it's it's... It's making you know the sigmoid curve, as people say. You try and get to the top of the curve, and then you try and you try and keep you try and keep yourself there, really, rather than going back down the curve. And and that takes a lot of foresight. It takes infrastructure, so that you know when you're winning, you know you are looking at at at, at where you go next. You know, and when you're building, you're looking at where you go next. And and you try to keep that. You know, you try to keep yourself on on top of the curve, really, and, and keep yourself mm -hmm. growing, which was. What people like Ferguson was just, you know, and, and Klopp wow. and even Mourinho over time, you know, uh, Guardiola, all these top football coaches, you know, they understand, uh, you know, the evolution of process and what that brings you. Um, and, yeah. and, and if you sit on your hands too long, you'll go backwards. And it's not all about money, mate. It's not, it's not, yeah. I, I don't care what anybody tells me. Yes, money is important, absolutely, and particularly. You know when 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 you, when you want to get continued uh, success because uh, you can you can buy in some really world class players and game changing players, but that's no good unless you do it from a solid foundation. You look at Leinster in 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 rugby union. You know you look at yeah. Exeter. You know Exeter they got massive foundations. Leinster got massive foundations in terms of academy. Their recruitment process is second to none. They buy the right players at the right yeah. time, you know, and, and there's a science to admit. And then the skill is the art, you know, there's a science to coaching and then the skill is the art to get the best out of people. And and you've got to find a way, you know, it, it is about finding a way, mate. It's yeah. when, you haven't, when you haven't got the money, it's about finding a way to get the best version 
of your team out in the park every day. And if I've got the money, then it's about the same thing. But it's it's being, you know, you've got to be really wise and 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 get what's always necessary rather than what's what's nice to have. It's always got to be what's necessary. And that's how I've always worked. We've always tried to find a way. Um yeah. Always try and find a way. And 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 that's down to the individual players and how you motivate them and get them bought into a culture, you know. And, and, you can't well, it's, it's like, and it's it's like it's like the money ball principle in in baseball, you know, and and you know the the film obviously opened a lot of people's eyes to that of going, well, if you haven't got the big budget to to spend on all these big stars, you need to dig down, you know, look at the analytics, look at what you actually need, and and actually pay a lot more focus to it. Whereas you know, throwing money at things just papers over the cracks at the end of the day. Um, mm-hmm. And, and and it doesn't buy you, you know, success. You know, you, we've seen we've seen football teams out there who have splashed millions of you know, ridiculous amounts of money, and they might have had a little bit of success, but it's not sustainable because they've got no foundations. And like you said, with the likes of Leinster and all that, where their academies just churn out, you know, fantastic players, the right kind of players for that environment. Um, and they use their money wisely. They bring in a professional here and, or, or, you know, a superstar here and there, but they bring on the next generation. And, and that's just, you know, so, so key. It's, it's like, it's, you know, it's a step-by-step process, mate. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's firstly, it's looking at what success looks like for you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and once you understand that, you can then look at where you currently are, which creates a gap analysis for you. And then your capability and capacity build. That gives you sustainability. Uh, and then that gives you consistency. And then that gives you the success. And that goes in cycles. You know, it goes in every five years. You know, people, if pe- you know, that's, that's what I believe. I'm not saying I'm right. There's, there's no right and wrong answers in many ways. But it's it's when I look at everything that I've always done in my <coughs> You know, we've always done, we've always tried to build in threes, you know, mm. like it takes 21 days to change a habit, it takes three years to build a team, whichever way you look at that. And, yeah. and, and when, when we break down all the things we've done, you know, it, it is about that. And it's that step by step process that I just mentioned there. And if you can get that in place uh, and, and you can, you, you know, you can keep discipline in relation to the process. Don't become subservient to the scoreboard. But realize that you have to win on the scoreboard to keep you. You know, if you want to be there yeah. tomorrow, you've got to win today. But also, yeah. if you find, you know, finding a chairman, finding a cultural fit as a club is so, so important. You know, if, if, you, if you've got a chairman who wants to win every game tomorrow, he's got to have deep pockets. And then that yeah. doesn't even guarantee you the, the wins. But if you get a if you get a chairman who, who's prepared to build and who's prepared to you know, to to take the rough for the smooth and the ups and downs, but as long as you show progress, and that's what they did at Leeds with me, they all show, as long as you show in progress, Phil, we can move forward. And that's all yeah. we ever did. And, and yeah, that, that that is it. And that's the only thing I'll say to any person, really, in rugby or in sport is it takes time to build. And if you've got the patience to do that, fine. If not, it's going to cost you a lot of money in a short space of time. But you know, if you do Very build, true. it's it's you, 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 you got, I think you've got a chance. So that's what that's why it's intriguing watching what's happening in Wales and in other parts of the world from a rugby perspective. And I think Ireland, Ireland of Ireland system is amazing. When you think of the success they've had the last fifteen years, domestically yeah. and internationally, it's incredible. Um, and do you think they'll uh, they'll continue that to to get the World Cup? Yeah, they could do. They, you know, they they've you know they got great head coach. You know, Faz is a and he's a he's a legend in both sports really, and he's he's a really principled, grounded individual. The way he coaches is is phenomenal. He's got you know he got people like Paul O'Connell around him. He's to be oh, you know John Fogarty, yeah. amazing. Um, Mike Cat. You know, coaching intellect in that group is amazing. You know, the rugby yeah. IP, I should say. Uh, in that, you know, France are the same. You know, Galte, Ibanez, you know, their their setup. South Africa, oh, you know, like Green <coughs> and 
and Felix Jones there and Razzie, you know, their their rugby intellect is, you know, Joe in New Zealand. It's just, it's just, phew, it's going to be a hell of a World Cup. It's going to be an it unbelievable is. World Cup, and the margins are going to be so fine, you know. Um, it's uh, it's so exciting watching and seeing all this unfold. I tell you, it's amazing. <laughs> I, I can imagine what. Well, Let's let's quickly look at your current role then. So about player welfare, coaching development, things like that. Obviously, player welfare is go- constantly going through the roof at the moment um, in terms of concussion and, and kind of injuries and, and things like that. What's your kind of take on it? Um. Yeah. The. the, the... Like what I've been amazed at with World Rugby is the amount of research and 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 time, effort, money that goes into that to try to make the game safer, basically, um, yeah. and to grow the game. You know that what talk about growing the game? What they're doing on the women's side this project Accelerate that Sally Horrocks, who's who's the lady who's in charge there of of women's rugby, with another lady called Nikki Ponsford, who played for England at over fifty caps over time. What they're doing with the women's game is unbelievable. What they're trying to do with the sevens game is is terrific. Same with the fifteens. Everybody is, you know, the intention is to grow the game. And then you look at the research side and you look at the the player welfare side. Um, what we're doing, you know, with a brain health service, which is all about looking after, you know, past players. Obviously, there'll be there'll be current players and future, you know, future players that'll, that'll come into this as well. There's there's a concussion, a work that we're doing on that. And, you know, look, everybody can do more, but, you know, what I see is, is incredible amount of work and research is going in to make it safer. Um, you know, every every woman that played in the recent World Cup down in New Zealand wore an instrumented mouth guard, which is, you know, they've got technology within the mouth guards that can, that can give you the amount of, you know, the amount of uh, contact that they have and the severity of the G-force of that contact, depending on which angle you make a tackle, for example. It's just unbelievable research. And 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 all that, you know, on match day, you know, the HIA process, the head contact process for the for the match officials, the HIA head impact um uh situation for players uh as well is you know, at the grounds when they're removed is amazing. So it, it's huge, mate, the amount of work. And, and and I don't directly get involved in some of it, but I get directly involved in 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 a lot of it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's blown me away, really, all that type of, the way they're trying to grow the game and the type of research mainly. And, and the four areas that, you know, that I'm involved in is one is the shape of the game, which is dealing with, the major competitions and the tier one coaches about the laws and about the application of laws. Can we make, how can we improve things? Then there's match officials, which is, you know, involved with, with, with the match officials management group. Um, and the, you know, obviously the, the top officials in the world and there's some, we got some brilliant refs, Wayne Barnes, Ben O'Keefe, Jaco Piper, who are the three main leaders at the moment. You've got Andrew Brace from Ireland, you know, uh, there's some brilliant refs around. And then I got the Emerging Nations, which is great through my Namibian experience. So I get involved in that. And then the other one is World Rugby Support, which is basically rugby services, trying to find and work with training and education, work with participation, who's run by another Welshman, Jason Lewis, um, to see how we can build capability and capacity in countries that have ambition uh, and potential to to compete at World Cups, you know. So there's four real, you know, big pillars there with a lot of diversity within within all of them, mate, you know, and it's... Yeah, massively. It's, just, it's amazing. And the people involved, you know, is, is, you know, is fantastic, you know, and seeing the game growing in Europe through the European Super Cup is another new competition they brought in between club level and international level. Which is which is wonderful, really, to grow the game in Europe. You know, people yeah. like Poland. You know, there's two Welshmen coaching Poland. There's a Welshman, Lynn Jones, is coaching the Netherlands. Um, yeah. And then you go to South America. You know, they're looking at getting into Super Rugby. You know, yeah, they've that's got, just been announced or, or yeah. whatever. They've got a new league there in the uh, South American league. You know, that's that's been going for a few years. 
And now they've got Chile, Uruguay, and Argentina representing South America at this World Cup in in France next year, which again is is amazing. It's it's growing, and you know the, the islands are growing. Fiji, you've got a Super Rugby team, you know there now the Drua, you know Mona Pacifica, which is another Super Rugby team, you know players around Samoa, Tonga. So, you know the game is just growing and growing and growing, and it's it's uh, it's phenomenal to see really and. Mm. Uh, the, the fact US. that even Portugal are going into the, the next World Cup, I mean, that's brilliant. Oh, you know? just, and they've been doing well in the European Super Cup. The Lusitanos, they called, which is their team, has been, um, you know, they've done really well. They, they lost in the final to Georgia um, over the last year or so um, uh, to the Black Lions, which is a Georgian team. Uh, and then you've got, as I say, the Netherlands, you've got the Delta, and then you've got the Brussels, uh, the Black Devils, which is, um, sorry, the Brussels Devils, which is a Belgian team. Then you've got Tel Aviv Heat. You've even got the team from Israel in that competition. It's just, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And Spain have got a, Spain have got a team in there. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's just, yeah, the game is just growing and growing. And um, it's going to arguably in the next, 10, 15, 20 years is going to grow outside some of the more traditional strongholds, you know, and and mm. the traditional strongholds have got to keep, got to keep, you know, keep themselves evolving as well. So it's it's well, let's let's face it, you know, obviously Wales lost to Georgia, and you know, with America having you know one of the next World Cups as well, they're going to put massive effort and focus, same as France are doing. You know, France have been absolutely pummeling it. Because they want to win the World Cup on their home turf, so giving the World Cup to, to some of these countries gives them focus, and, and yeah, you know, I look forward to it. I mean, I, I as a proud Welshman like yourself, I do worry for for us at times, um, but it gives opportunities at the end of the day. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, it, it does, mate. It does. Is there's, uh, there's huge opportunities uh, out there for for us to grow rugby and and. You know the one the one thing that you know the one thing I've learned in in from you know just with my Welsh hat on really the one thing I have learned a lot of a lot about over my time is when I is is the respect people have for Wales the yeah. the respect people have for you know for Welsh rugby around the world is is incredible. Um, I'm not sure we always we realize we always realize that in Wales. I'm not sure if we do understand how people respect us um, and what we stand for as a game. And I think the regions, for all are said and written and and whatever, and same as the Welsh team. You know, we we do bloody well. You know, we bat. You know, we bat above our our ourselves often. You know, and Gats has done it for years. He's back. Going to try and do it again. And you know, dies back in Cardiff, and slowly the Blues are, are built. Uh, well, not the Blues anymore. Cardiff Rugby are building the Scarlets. Yeah. You know, the Dragons, the Ospreys. You know, we got four regions. We got to protect them, I think. And you got North Wales, as for me, should be another region, like a developing, like, like Connaught was at the start for Irish rugby. I believe yeah. RGC North Wales can be the same. And, I spent some time up with Mooney where we got him promoted from the championship into the premiership where they currently are. And I just think it's an amazing opportunity up there to, to further grow the game, you know, in a strategic, if you put a strategic rugby plan together, they've got to be included and, and you can provide yeah. opportunities there, um, uh, which which will help Welsh rugby, you know. And, and do, do you think that that's actually likely to happen though, given the fact that uh, even the regions at the moment. You, I mean, you see across the border in England, you know, players re-signing and, and, you know, teams moving forward, even with all the kind of financial issues that are happening over there. But you look at the regions at the moment and, and there are loads of players who are going to be out of contract at the end of the season who probably haven't even started negotiating because there's that old funding issue from the WRU you know, how much are they going to get? Will they, won't they? I mean, when I spoke to Dave Buttress about it, you know, he was saying that they're pushing for for a five or six year plan because then they can actually plan rather than what has been that hand to mouth, right? We'll agree it's for next year and next year and next year. So realistically, can you see them actually creating a, a, a fifth region or, or even a, a, 
a sub-region up in North Wales to help develop? No, no. Well, at the moment, probably not. Um, I think if you looked at a strategic plan over 10 years, maybe, and you could say, right, OK, we, we could work towards that. Um, you know, and it's and it's and it's working towards things. You know, it, it's it's to, rather than you know putting putting the finger in offers dike as you say every year. It it's it it's and I think that's why it's taking the time that it's taking. That the union doesn't want to go bust. None of the regions yeah. want to try and go bust. And and I think you know they it's, it's tough on the players. It's tough on the coaches. I've been in myself. I understand that. It's not easy. But I would imagine you know some players agents will be looking elsewhere for them no doubt and that's quite right and proper for them to look after themselves but you know I'm pretty confident that well I, I suppose my half glass full mentality is that in due time people will you know it will get sorted out and we will be able to build for you know for the next six years and then you know halfway through in year three let's look at trying to put another three years on it so you've got another six years and let's try, you know, let's try and see if you if you can if we can always have a, have a you know have a six year vision if you like, um, and it's not always easy no. to do that. But you know the power of the of the Welsh jersey and the power of the of the Principality Stadium perhaps allows us to do that. And then if we can get a longer term commitment, maybe the the regions then can look outside of our borders to grow to grow their business. Uh, potential as well, and you know the Scarlets. You know the Scarlets are well known worldwide. You know, and 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 are we maximising that opportunity? I don't know to be honest, but there's more than one way of skinning a cat, mate. And and hopefully, Definitely. if we can if we can get that longer term approach, um, we can be you know we can be stronger for it. You know, stronger for longer, maybe I don't know, but uh... <laughs> yeah, well, that, definitely, and, and and you know, I hope so. Um, you mentioned about talking and dealing with tier ones and their coaches about getting them on board with the consistency of laws. I can imagine with a certain uh, South African gentleman who likes to go on Twitter and you know, put rants on YouTube, uh, Mr. Rasmus, um, that, that could probably be some interesting conversations uh, with him. I, th- I think, again, mate, it's all about you know relationships and build and, and and building understanding of what everybody's trying to achieve and 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 what the processes are to to achieve that you know and, and I think that you know certain things by doing look when you go on social media as you know maybe better than myself it's it's like I, you know I'm I'm pretty vanilla on it on there really I don't say you're always much. in the gym I'm always in the gym exactly <laughs> so you know I I don't I don't have much of an opinion because it, it it can't make much of a difference really but but some people they'll do what they 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 feel they need to do at times and and sometimes you know it's not it's it's not been a good look for the game it's not been a good look for anyone in, individually certain you know people's families have have suffered um and that's not good for the game generally so for me there's always a way to do it and 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 you know, it's it's an official way to do things. You know, the way we feed back to coaches, the way coaches feed into the match officials, there's always got to be that element of of an official pathway and process. And that's got to be fit for purpose. And it's and it's got to be giving people um, you know, what they need to move their teams forward or to move the you know to move the match officiating forward so all of that was you know was unfortunate but every, you know there, uh, there's there's no condoning anything at all um of what went on and you know it, it's something you know we've got to move forward with and, and try and make uh, or create the best opportunity for people to communicate and and and, and grow the game and and retain the integrity and the values within that you know is is important Definitely, hundred percent. Look, I, I've taken up enough of your time today. I'm sure there's another gym session to be done today. It almost no, feels like you, you should be sponsored by Robert Davis uh, Fitness. Yeah, other gyms are available, but yeah, no, um, no, he's, uh, it's good. It's, it's around the corner, but uh, yeah, so it's good. But so, just a quick one. Obviously, we're, we're recording this, you know, on the cusp of 2023, uh, 20, not 2013. It's going back sometime. Um, so what does the next 12 months hold for, for you and for, for the world game then? Um, 
Well, when it holds, when it holds for the in the world, well, from personally and from the game point of view, extremely exciting. You know, you you got, you've obviously got um, some new laws coming in from January the first. So there's some exciting changes to come there, and it'll be very interesting to see what's going to happen there. There could be some, you know, law trials in other parts of the world, which is exciting. You've got the Six Nations come in, you know, you've got the, the Rugby Championship come in, you've got the domestic leagues, and then you've got the World Cup. Uh, yeah. And you've got the Seven Series, and you've got the women's game growing, and you've got new competitions coming in on international level with some of the emerging nations. So just generally, mate, it's one of huge excitement and 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 hopefully some good change for the better, and what I'm looking forward to is is this year. But what I'm looking forward to then is the preceding four years leading up to the Rugby World Cup in Australia, because it'll be the first full World Cup cycle that I've been able to take yeah. part in. Uh, and you know, I feel coming into the job, I feel like I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a lead singer coming into a into a rock band and trying to learn everybody else's songs. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a way to describe it. Well, it'll be it'll be with the help of a, a lot of people. We'll be hopefully writing a few new songs come, you know, come come the end of this year and going into the next cycle. So it's not as exciting, it. I'm very privileged and and to be in the position, and I'm very proud to represent World Rugby and and also to represent Wales in in that part of it, and and you know, represent our country as well, you know, and have an opportunity. To be on the world stage, stage as a Welshman to try and help the game grow with many other, you know, good people. So yeah, as I said at the beginning, it's all about people, and I've learned so much in rugby and the experiences I've had through meeting some amazing people and visiting some f fabulous country, but countries. But uh, apart from Wales, mate. You know that's still my favourite destination. Although I'm, I'm Africa's in my heart after spending five years in Namibia. I got to say I'm, I'm a real, uh, I'm, uh, I have a real affinity with Africa. But, uh, but Wales, Yorkshire as well is another part that I'm deeply in love with. But, uh, but still comes back to Wales being the place really. Exactly, mate. Exactly, mate. It's been. An absolute pleasure having you on you know the insights and, and the kind of seeing over the fence um not only from your playing days your coaching and to what you're doing now i mean you know, look we'll have to have you back on because there'll be lots of developments going on and, and you know kind of to get that insight into it that inside track is, is just going to be fantastic so might have to get you on with uh with moff as well just yeah that'd to, be good that'd be good fun <laughs> if, if you can get a word yeah. Oh well, yeah. He's 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 pretty. Yeah, he's an interesting character, David. He's a knowledgeable man. People should. Uh, people, some. Yeah, he's 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 done. A, he's 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 got a he's got a view, was not he? He's got a direct view, which which sometimes doesn't always suit people. But nevertheless, there's there's always a bit of substance to what he says, mate. To be fair, to him. that's what I found. He, isn't he? Yeah, he, exactly. He. He's one of the characters of, of the game, definitely. For sure. But uh, well, I appreciate your time, mate. It. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Happy New Year, mate. Have a good time. Uh, you too, buddy. Thanks Take for care. watching, everyone. Make sure you subscribe and check out the next episode.